and welcome once again to another Coffee and Heroes podcast. Time now for another creator interview. And today we are chatting to Power Rangers royalty. I mean, taking over from an acclaimed run by Kyle Higgins is one thing, but relaunching the Power Rangers with two brand new interlinking number ones is quite another. Uh, from Boom Studios, both Mighty Morphin and Power Rangers have been very well critically received and among the company's top sellers. Not content with playing God in one universe, our guest today is part of the creative team be- behind one of the most ambitious comics titles crossover this year. Kicking things off in early February, around the 16th, with the supermassive one-shot, before dovetailing into a brand new ongoing title in Rogue Sun on February 23rd. He has joined forces with his Power Rangers Shattered Great co-creator Kyle Higgins and Image Comics for a brand new superhero universe. Your host as always, Alan, owner and operator of Coffee and Heroes, joined this evening by Keith. And we are, of course, talking to Mr. Ryan Parrott. And we thank you very much for coming on to our little show. It is a genuine pleasure. How are you keeping? I am good, man. That was the best intro I've ever heard. You, I, halfway through it, I'm like, who's he talking about? He's doing a, this guy's awesome. <laughs> so I, th- I appreciate it, man. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. We're always up for massaging a few egos. It seems to, you know, get good answers out of the guests that way. So, you know, get off on the right foot. So, I mean, it's been an interesting couple of years, you could say, uh, worldwide. You know, how, how did you cope and adapt to, you know, lockdown, restrictions, the pandemic, work and life in general? How's, how's the last couple of years been for you? Uh, you know, I, I, I think everybody's kind of going on with the, you know, it's going okay. You know, I, I, we've been, uh, lucky. I think the nice thing about being a writer is that, um, in a lot of ways, your life doesn't change all that much. You just sort of spend a little more time in a nook writing. Um, and my wife's a writer as well. So both of us were just sort of in the house working. We just had to, she was in the kitchen and I'm in the other room and we flipped back and forth and whatnot. So we, you know, for the most part, I think we've, we've stayed good. There's, we've had a, we've had some, we've lost some people, some, some people close to us, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, but um, but for the most part, you know, I think, you know, hoping that things start to get better, trying to do the best we can. Uh, but yeah, you know, like the the comics have been really helpful. Comics is a, is a, is a nice industry, not a nice, it's a, it's a, the industry is still moving along and, and work has been saying, so I'm very, very lucky and very happy to be part of that, all that. So, but, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Here's uh, here's hoping we, we certainly feel, I, I'm optimistic about the, about the fairly near future anyway, Ryan, but then. I'm a hard boy to keep down at the best of times with regard to optimism. <laughs> um, so would it be fair to say that, you know, you know, in some ways, you know, the, the, the being housebound has allowed you to focus more on your creative process or has it, has it been difficult to, to focus and concentrate? I mean, I, I, when you think of, I think it's been almost, it's been a year and a half now that we've been really locked in. So I, I think for, for the first part, it was nice. Cause it was like, it was easier to sort of focus in on the work and, you know, it was like a weird, like, this sounds so weird to say this, but it's like, it's like a weird gift. You're like, wow, I have all this time and to focus on the thing. I can't go out, you know, I can't, I don't have, I don't have to go see my friends. I don't have to go see family. <laughs> but, uh, but now, now after about a year of it, I, I, I do miss, like, I'm a person who likes to write in coffee shops. I like to go into coffee shops and sit in the corner and write for a few hours. Cause I like getting out and being away and making it like, you know, going and get your coffee, sit down, focus, all that stuff. I come up with more stuff on the walk back and forth. I'll write for three hours, but come up with half the good stuff on the walk there and back um so i do miss that element and it's and so it is it forced me to sort of create a pattern in my own house which was like get up and make coffee and sit in the corner and all that stuff so but i do miss that so so i think for a little while it was cool because i was like i'm gonna get everything done i ever wanted and then about a year half a year in i was like no that's i'm still me that's not gonna <laughs> change yeah and uh our 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 things restrictions and stuff easing up over, over your you said you're in la yeah, I'm in LA. Um, it was easing up for a little while there. We've had a lot of surges, I think, recently. So it hasn't, it's gotten back to being a little dicey. Uh, friends that I went and saw friends a little bit for, I think, in the right before, hol- right before the holidays. And now it's like, eh, maybe we can, let's hold off. Let's hold off till March. How about that? You know? <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I mean, to redirect back towards comics, of course, the big question we always like to ask is, you know, DC or Marvel? Or have you always had a preference for indie comics? I, I actually, it's funny, I'll say this, I think if you had to put a gun in my head, I think Image is actually where I started my first love of comics. Like, I really, like, look, I, I love, I'm like, I'm, I'm cliche. I, like, you know, you love the heroes of the DC universe, they're like the gods, you know, but I think some of the writing in the Marvel world is always so interesting. They're always trying new things and, 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 and you know, taking chances that I think, um, you know, like, yeah, so I, I think you have those two elements. But, like, I was 13 when Marvel started. Or sorry, when Image started. And <laughs> Big difference. I was going to say, you're I, looking yeah, really I, well for your age. I'm 47 years old, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But 
uh, yeah, I was 13 when Image started, and like that was, and I was, I wanted to be an artist. Like I was going to, I was like, that's what I wanted to do. And so I remember following all of those guys, McFarlane and Leefeld and 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 Lee and Eric Larson and all those guys. I loved Sylvester. So I loved all their books. And then I remember waking up one day and I was like, wait, they all left the company and they're going to make their own heroes. You can do that. And so I remember going in and literally getting a box at my uh, they got, I got my first box at the comic store around the corner from my house. And they just I was like, give me all the number ones. And and that lasted like three months. And then I was out of money <laughs> But like, because they put a lot of books out when they first started those guys. Yeah. Um, but like, I think I'm an image guy just because I remember thinking like, oh, it, it was the first time that I remember thinking this is about putting the creators sort of in front of the characters a little bit. And. And I thought that was something cool because it made me realize, oh, this is a profession. This is something you can do. This is something that people can go make. Before that, I was always just like, someone's, I never knew who was writing Spider-Man. I never knew who was writing Batman. I just knew I liked those characters. And Image kind of made me go, oh, wow, It's these are the people I should follow. These are the creators. So I love that part. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like uh, when you're saying you were that age whenever Image started, it sounds like we're all an age. And uh, <laughs> I remember that as well, that, uh, you know, you, you heard Stan Lee's voice on Spider-Man and his Amazing Friends, but you didn't know it was Stan Lee. You, yeah. know, you didn't know necessarily who that was. But uh, but yeah, they, they, they sort of per, per personalities to creators, I guess, like nearly celebrity creators almost. Yeah, uh, like Layfield had like a Levi Jeans commercial. I was like, what the heck is going on? That guy's a comic book writer. Like, that's <laughs> insane. Uh, but it's funny you said that about Stan Lee. That is, I remember when he passed away, somebody put out a tweet about that. And I was like, and they were talking about how Stan Lee was the first person they ever saw that they went, that's the guy behind the scenes. Cause they would do the little drawing of his face in the corner and yeah. he'd be like, Hey, Spidey pals or spider. And you're like, wait, that's the guy. And so like, I do like, remember that was the first guy. And then, and then with image, it was like the artists were rock stars. Like they were yeah. like, I could go, like I could walk through. I remember I was at comic con when I was like 14 and Eric Larson bumped into me as he was trying to get some, he was looking through like a long box of old issues. And I turned, and I was like, Hey, and I saw his name tag and I was like, Oh, <gasps> And like, like, like gasped in front of him. And he's like, are you all right? I'm like, you're Eric Larson. He's like, yeah. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> so, but yeah, so like that was, it made, it made me like, it made me love the artist as much as the characters. And so I love that. Yeah. That's, uh, that, that's awesome. And, you know, so you, you said, you know, Image was the first time you, you realized that, but what, was there something that got you into comics as a reader before that? What was your first comic book experience? If you, if you can, if you can remember, recall. Um, I think it, it was kind of random. Like I always liked drawing. I was drawing from when I was like three or four years old. Like I, I that's all I always thought of, about doing. And my mom would, you know, my mom would, you know, the spinner rack at the end of the, at the end of the checkout line at like Ralph's or whatever. And she would grab like a bunch of comics. And I remember like, I'd never read like runs for like a really long time. I would read random issues. Like I'd get like the new warriors number 17 or I'd get the ish Batman number whatever. And it would be him fighting Catman. It was like, they were never like the, I was, I didn't get like the big good stuff. I just got random things, right? The ones were like Spider-Man's a wrestler for three issues. Um, <laughs> so I got that stuff. And then I remember when my, uh, my parents divorced and my, I, I got, i my, my father remarried and he had, they had, they had two uh, two stepbrothers and my uh, older stepbrother was really into the Punisher. And, uh -huh. and so, cause you know, you're a teenager, that's who you're into. And so <laughs> he would, he would give me his old issues to read. And so I, that was the first run I ever read was like, sort of like the middle, like fifties and sixties of the original Punisher runs. Um, I, w I wish I remember who the artists and the writers were. I don't remember anymore, but like, that was when I was like, I remember, I remember not remembering, I remember not knowing you had to read the captions. <laughs> like that, like, I was like, I would read all the dialogue. I thought the captions were just like the editor's notes. And I was like, man, there's a lot of, like a lot of weird things here. And then I remember at one point I told him, he's like, you should go read the captions. And I was like, oh, they're in a monologue. And so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that was like my first big run. But then after that, I think I finally started, I remember my grandfather took me into a comic book store in Bakersfield, California called Inner Sanctum Comics. And there was a black trade paperback of Death in the Family on the wall. And I was like, and it's him holding Robin. And I was like, can I, can I have that? And he bought that for me. And that's the first run that I ever read that I was like, oh, wow. Okay. Yep. I got it. I got, this is, this is emotional. This is real. I love Batman. I wanted to be Robin. Like that was it. And so from that moment on, I think it was just, then I would just read anything. And then I started following the art and kind of moved on. So it was like a random way of walk in. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. I mean, it's those, those spinner racks and those random issues, I think, were how a lot of people started, you know, picking up a bit of that or whatever it happened to be on the rack or, or on the shelf, you yeah. know, because that, that's the way it worked over here as well, you know, before you discovered uh, direct, you know, direct market sort of stuff. So 
Yeah. Uh, a very it's good too one. bad because I, I don't know if that we have that anymore. We don't have that sort of like I, I wonder what's replaced it. Maybe it's maybe it's podcasts. <laughs> like, you know, what, I mean? <laughs> what, what place the spinner rack? Like who how do people kind of randomly wander into comic books now? It, it, or do they because like I didn't seek it out. You know, it was more like it was just there. And you're like, that's cool. And that's flashy. And with so many other options these days, I do, I do wonder it, I, you know what? Also, but they weren't making superhero movies like they were now. So maybe it, it all probably it all it all comes out in the wash. I'm suppose. I suppose. Uh, well, I was uh, I was lucky enough to be. Uh, Alan was was away at the weekend, and I was lucky enough to to be managing the store for him. And uh, a mother and her her uh, her kid came in. He must have been about seven or eight. And uh, I was like, oh, first time in the store. And he was like, yeah, yeah. All the kids in the class are talking about this store. So obviously, it gets passed around the playground. There's a store in Belfast. You know, there's a, you know. So. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, so that was kind of nice. Are you guys the only store in like that area, or no? There, there is one other store close to us, but we very much specialize in comics. Uh, there's, there's Perfect. a big, there's a big chain in the UK called uh, Forbidden Planet, and they very much specialize in merchandise, full aisles of Funko Pops, things like that. What they do, they do very well, and they've been around a long time. But with our store, I mean, we've got around eighty thousand back issues, um, new releases every week. We have. We have a big emphasis on indie comics, so it's it's always great to chat to you know creators who work within Image and so forth. Because in in our store, we have quite a unique ethos. I think we don't say read Batman, read Spider Man. We say, oh, you enjoyed that run? Oh, that Batman run that was written by Tom King, and the artist there is you know Clay Man. Here's what else they've done. So we we're very much pushing creators rather than characters, which I think is so important. Um, we, we had a really good chat. With, I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, we had a really great <laughs> chat with Chip Zdarsky. was a great example. So Chip Zdarsky took over Daredevil. And I thought this will be quite a comic booky four-color, Mark Wade-esque run on Daredevil. And it couldn't be further from the truth because I thought that because of something like Sex Criminals, he's quite a, you know, a goofy personality. But, you know, then we get people in the store into a certain creator. They pick up everything from them. So I think creators, in a way, just as you say, maybe podcasts, I think social media is a big thing. I think that um, people now follow creators. And that the creators have almost replaced the spinner racks, if you will. It's, it's almost like, yeah. here's the new title from such and such. And people, you know, jump onto it that way. So... Um, but yeah, no, just, just to double back on the, uh, the, the story about death and the death in the family, I find it really interesting. I'm curious if your grandfather thought that was a Batman book similar to Adam West, Burt Ward, Batman 66 and knew what he was placing into your innocent hands. Well, my grandfather was, um, look, let me just say this. He was a really awesome guy and, uh, he probably let me rent and watched things I shouldn't have. So like, I remember watching alien three and I bought, I was like, can I rent this? And that was the nice thing about blockbuster back in the day. You could go up to the thing, you take the, the thing behind the, the tape behind it. So your parents never saw the cover. They just saw the title of the thing. It's like, Oh sure. So I brought him alien three. We watched alien three. And I remember halfway through the movie, it's like, if you've ever watched a, an R rated movie with people who you, all of a sudden you hear every single swear word and you're like, wow, there's a lot of cussing in this thing. And my grandfather goes, you know, son, there's a lot of cussing in this thing. And we're like 10 minutes in the movie. And I was like, are you going to turn it off? And he's like, no. And he like left the room and let me watch it. So he's that kind of guy. So I'm sure he was like, whatever. He'll learn. Not there's nothing he's not learning on the playground that I'm going to stop him from doing. So God bless him. He, he would do that stuff. So. Lovely. Lovely. Well, we'll fast forward from you being a fan and getting into comics and, and just focus on how did you break into the industry? You said you were playing around with being an artist at first. Did you try to break in as an artist and then decide on writing? Do you do a little bit of both? What was the process there? Well, I went to art school thinking I was going to draw comic books. Like, that's what I wanted to do. I drew the all I, – I was like – I was the artist guy in high school. Like, that's what people knew me for doing. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to go to – I'm going to go to to art school and I'm going to become a proper artist. And then and then I'm going to uh, create – make this amazing portfolio and I'm going to – and then I go to San Diego Comic-Con my second year and then I'm going to get discovered. And that was my whole plan. I was going to be the Quentin Tarantino of comic books. And then I started drawing. I was like – and I, when you go to college, just all of a sudden you're around a whole bunch of other people. And I start looking at everybody else's art and I'm like, hmm. Well, I was good for Vegas, but I'm not quite as good here. And I just realized I just didn't have the sort of the the talent and the sort of the 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 drive that I knew it was going to take to draw that stuff. And so I was like, what else am I going to do? And my, my, I remember my parents, I was like, I don't think I'm going to be a comic artist. And all of a sudden they were like, so we got to change majors because we're not wasting our money for you to <laughs> wait four years to figure that out. So I went into, I went into film and TV and I was like, oh, I, I like that stuff. I took videography and all that stuff. So I transitioned to that. And then, you know, for the most of my, for like 10 years, I worked on that. I, would work, I wrote on TV shows and I worked at, I worked at Bad Robot. 
for JJ Abrams. I was all that stuff. And in the middle, while I was in college, I still, some of my roommates were writing, were go, they got me back into comic books. Cause I was like, I stopped reading for a little while and they got me back in and which I think you need, sometimes you really need, like you, it's hard to read in a vacuum. It's really great when you have other people you can read. And I remember reading, um, what was it? Batman hush. And like halfway through that book, when you still, I mean, can I spoil Hush or am I? I, 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 I think you're safe 20 years on. I think, I think I'm safe. Wait, you never know. There's some kids like, why? <laughs> spoiler <laughs> warning, people. Spoiler warning. Yeah. But when you, before you know, actually, I can just say it without spoiling it. Before you know who the killer is, I remember we were reading those books and like seeing like the 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 little signals and the little clues. And I remember being in the backseat of my friend's car. We were training. And I was like, oh man, this is what comics are about. It's about reading and it's the month to month. It's the conversation. It's the water cooler of it all. And I loved all that. Anyways, long, I'm sorry. I kind of went off track there. But I did all that, got me back into comic books. And in the middle of when I was in college, I met Kyle Higgins, who was also a filmmaker. And he loved comics. I We just started, you know, geeking out over Watchmen and all that stuff. And he ended up working in comic books and I would help him when, you know, we both moved to LA after we got out of school and he was trying to break into comic books. And so I would hang out with him on the weekends and he'd like pitch me ideas and, and I'd be like, yeah, let me, you can do this. You can do that. And so as he was starting to make his way into the comic world, um, he got, he went from writing one mini series on a weekend to getting two live, like two, two, he got Nightwing and he got Deathstroke on the same week. And he was wow. like, so he calls me, yeah, he calls me and he's like, cause it's a new 52. And he's like, Hey man, so I have to write three issues of Batman that's double shipping by the end of this month. And I have to do outlines for these two, my, these two runs and Nightwing's my favorite character of all time. And I want to put a lot of effort into that. Can you come in and write Batman with me? And I was like, cause I'd help break the story. Cause he just tell me, so I knew it. And I was like, yeah, I can come in. I'll, I'll, I'll write, I'll just help you out for a few issues. That'll be fine. So I was like, why not write Batman? That'll be fun. And so I did that and I came in and wrote Batman and my first line of Batman was Dick Grayson. I was like, this is, it's all downhill from here. What am I doing? Um, <laughs> and so I did that. And then when I was at bad robot, they, I remember I went to the comic store and I got my first issue and I had it there and I was pretty excited about the whole thing. And one of the producers there saw that and said, Oh, Hey, I, you write comics. So I was like, yeah, he's like, well, we do some Star Trek comics. Are you interested in doing those as well? And because I, I think because I was an established writer at the time and not just an assistant, they were like, would you be interested in doing that? And so I said, yeah. And I meant, I talked to Mike Johnson, who was the, who's been writing Star Trek comics for a really long time. And he's one of the most, one, he taught me everything I know. Um, Sorry, Kyle. Um, and, <laughs> and so I got to work with him. And that was a fun thing, too, because I got to sit down with him. And he was like, he, I could, we, we had coffee. And I could, he was like sitting with his arm folded. And he's like, oh, he thinks I'm here to steal his money. <laughs> he's here, I'm here to take his money. But we became really, really good friends really quickly. And so we wrote together for a while. And that kind of got me from that. That was like, oh, wow. Like, I really like writing comic books. And that's the thing that's really great about comics opposed to TV is and I've worked on Revolution and I worked on the show Chance that was on Hulu for a little while with um, uh, Hugh Laurie. And when you write TV, especially when you first start, you don't write a lot. You know, you, 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 you're in the room, you're breaking stuff, but you're not, you're not writing a lot. So it was really great for me to be able to have comic books where I got to write all the time. So I was using the things that I learned from all the really great TV writers in the room. And I was able to put those into comic books where it was all my decision making. So that was where I got to sort of transition. And I still go back and forth, but that's one of the things that that's how I broke in in a weird way. It was like, it was sort of like a side hustle because I was like, well, that'll be fun to do. I really like, I, I knew I wanted to be a TV writer. But I didn't know that I would be able to make a living in comics. I didn't know how to get in. And then I kind of found my way in. And then once I got in, I'm never leaving. <laughs> uh, and, and, and neither you should. You're not allowed to leave at this stage, Ryan. Uh, but, I mean, you, you've kind of you kind of sideways answered this question. But, you know, while you've worked outside of them, you certainly seem to have an enjoyment for licensed property, Star Trek, Power Rangers, Turtles, Army of Darkness. And as you just mentioned, that the shortly, you know, the sadly short-lived and lesser known but particular favorite of mine, Revolution. Uh, I mean, and I guess it's that it's that TV background that draws you to those properties. I mean, a little bit, yeah. Like it, it I think the, the that's what you have to learn real quickly as a as sort of a staff writer and a young TV writer is like you're you're not usually writing your voice. You're having to figure out a way to write for the voice of the people who created the show. Um, so you have to learn like what you know, what is it, what how do when they when they craft those characters, what who do they sound like, what do they what it drives them, what makes them interesting and unique. Um, and so that's what you learn doing in TV. And a nice thing about doing license is the same thing. Like I, you know, I was 13 or 14. I think I was 14 when the Power Rangers came out. So like I watched those characters. I know those voices from my head from watching that show. So when they came in, they're like, hey, would you be interested in pitching a Power Rangers? I'm like, yeah, I can do that. I know those characters. Like, you know, um, but that's I think what drives me a little bit is, is I really like playing with other people's toys. Like it's a lot <laughs> easier 
to play with other people's characters than it is to create your own. Having created my own recently and being like, wow, there's a lot of things you just sort of take for granted that you get from writing a licensed property. Like the nice thing about a Power Ranger comic book is I know the structure of that show. I know they're going to go to high school. I know they're going to uh, Reed is going to send a monster down. They're going to get into a fight. They're going to morph. They're going to get the robots out and they're going to fight the ro- like that's what's going to happen because it's in the show. I don't have to come up with that. You create your own character. All of a sudden, you're like, what are they doing? Who are they hanging out with? Where are they going? You know, like what makes them interesting and unique? So, like, the nice thing about writing for license is that you do get that opportunity. And also, you know, you dream. I think all of us, I, I, the thing that I've also learned just about almost every comic book writer that I know is like, they're all fans first. We all started because we read stuff when we were kids or when we, maybe not even kids, but we started reading and going, I really like this. And I think we all, in a weird way, just want to put a brick in the wall for the characters that we love. Like, I think that's what I love about comic book characters in general. You asked earlier about, you know, who like DC or Marvel. The greatest thing about Batman is like it, comic book characters like Batman, Superman, all those characters. They've been around for, I think, almost, almost 100 years now. And think about how many different writers have taken those, like have, have handed that character, written some stuff, and then handed it off to somebody else. There is no other medium in the world that has ever done that. Nothing. No movie, TV shows. None of that has. There's one Hamlet. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, unless you count the other movie. But like Shakespeare <laughs> did it, and then we're good. But imagine you write Batman, and then what's so cool is they evolve over time. They all and everybody adds a little brick. Everybody adds a little moment. Every and so like the idea that I would get to be able to do that for like the fact that the Ranger Slayer has become like a cool thing that people like. That's insane. Like I that's like I made a little brick that I got to put in the wall, and then when I leave, that's gonna be there for whoever comes next and adds to it. And I love that. I think that's the that's the real beauty of comic books is sort of it's a it's a community growth and building of a character and i and that and 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 i can be part of that you can be part of that our kids can be part of that and there's no other medium like that <laughs> that's uh that's a fantastic metaphor really like that you know adding to the mythos you know but uh yeah. and, and and kudos sir for uh you know aside from from jericho and firefly revolution is one of my uh, most lamented losses with regard to TV shows. Oh, thank you, man. It was a that was a really fun that was a really fun thing. I was there for two seasons. I was there from the I was there when Eric came in and pitched it. He came in and pitched the idea, and and I helped help the design the logo with him. And then he was like, "Do you want to come on the show?" And I was a writer assistant for two seasons. I wrote an episode. So I was there when we broke season three, and then when it didn't get we didn't get to yeah. make it, which was really sad. But yeah, it was a lot of fun, and uh, you know, like that was. That was a different age of television, too. That was like yeah. that thing premiered at like a 4.7. Like it's like an insane amount of people were watching it. Now a show premieres at like a 1.2 and they're like, it's a hit. So like <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. But I'm really glad you liked it. It was a lot of fun. I learned I learned a lot. Eric's a really, really I'm really happy that he's succeeded with the boys because like that I know that's his style and that's what he always loved. But he he taught me a lot and was one of the most gracious uh, people I've ever had to work with, which is really cool. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I mean, it's interesting just that we'll we'll have one last question just before we jump into, you know, Supermassive and Rogue Sun. We get to the meat of that. You've you've talked, of course, about crafting your own worlds and all the collaboration that goes into that. I mean, given that you've got an art background, we always like to chat with writers about, you know, what's their collaboration process between the writer and the artist on your comics? I mean, do you both tend to stay in your own lanes, as it were? You know, you, you write, the artist draws. Or do you go back and forth on ideas? Obviously, you have an artistic background, so maybe it's slightly different for yourself. I mean, how how closely do you work with your artists? We've we've talked to writers who literally email us stuff and they've never met the the artist, and we've talked to guys who are in the room with them. What what what's your preferred method? Um, well, I've I mean, I think it, it varies from artist to artist. I think you that's one of the the hard parts of like whenever you start a new book is like that feeling out period when you first get when you first give them the script and then you get like the layouts for the first time you're like okay is the stuff that i'm writing and explaining am i doing a good enough explaining it to you do, wh- how much detail do you want from me how much detail do you like some artists love as much detail as you can give them other ones are like it's an alien world cool i got it and then they'll just kind of run with it so everybody's different and i think you you feel it out differently and and i've been lucky enough to work with some pretty incredible you know artists um which i'm i'm <laughs> did it i wonder if a writer's ever come on and been like i've worked with some pretty crappy artists <laughs> 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 i just like everybody we've had to cut those parts out 
<laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. But uh, like, like the first guy that I really worked with, like, was Dan Mora. Like Dan, I got Dan Mora to do Go Go to start with, and I was like, this is great. Like, I don't even have to really write that much. He's just gonna do it and make me look good. Um, but the just the way you, so the way that I worked, um, most of the artists I've worked with are for uh, are do not live in the United States. So most of the time, I don't talk to them outside of them getting the scripts, and usually the editors are the ones who sort of like go back and forth. So you kind of do what you best you can on the page. And I try to be like, I, I try to be spry on the page when I write up the descriptions and how I work with the artist. I don't want to overdo it. I, I occasion, I will only really like tell people angles like close or wide when I, when I feel like it's important that they understand what the information, like for instance, if we're going into a scene at the beginning, I'll be like, okay, we're in the, we're in angel Grove and we're wide because I need to establish the location where we're at. And so uh, I'll do that, but I usually won't tell them, you know, medium, closer, tight, like really tight on unless it's really important because I think the artists, they know they're not just telling the story, they're composing the page. And so I don't want to try and dictate to them what it is because I'm not composing the page. Like I want, you know, there's that thing that they say artists, there's two different ways to look at a comic page. It's by panel and also by page. And they take that in consideration. And as the writer, that that's not really, that's me. That's like a writer sitting on set telling the director how to move where to, where to put the camera. That's not my job. Um, I think the only thing you got to, and I think if you do it right, you can it, it tell them the, the information, the, the stuff that's important that they'll, the, and a, they'll, they'll focus on it. I think there's a way to write it so that they understand what's important without telling them do this and do that because it is a collaboration and the artist does so much. Like they, they carry you so much. I can say, you know, a guy standing in the middle of an alien world, that's easy for me to write. That is going to take them an hour and a half to, you know, just to think of what they have to do. <laughs> so I try to be as, I try to be as uh sort of, I try to be as collaborative and sort of easygoing as well. I usually will write little notes on top to also where it's like, hey, so this is an idea that I like for like whenever we did like the the, the transformation sequences in in like uh in, the morphing sequences in Mighty Morphin, like the full page ones I really love to do. Um, there's a perfect example. I remember I wrote one for Dan Moore and I was like, I want to do a transformation sequence like the show. Have fun. And, and I was like, you could do this, you could do this. And we just started, like, I would, I, he did the first one. And then the next issue, I was like, you could try this. And he's like, what about this? And so it became like a little <laughs> bit of a, like, he was like, he loved it. But then when I did it, when I worked with Daniele, um, uh, Demio, uh, and Simone Demio, when I worked with them, I actually got to meet them in New York and we were sitting there and I was like, oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I haven't got to give you guys as many trans morphing sequences. And they were like, oh, we hate them. I was like, you, what? <laughs> You hate drawing the morphs? He goes like, well, yeah, because like we have to draw what's on the show. And I was like, no, you don't. And they're like, what? And I, and what they didn't understand was they thought when I said morphing sequence that I, that I wanted them to do exactly what was on the show. I was like, I want you to do whatever you want. I want you to guys to have fun and do crazy. And you could see the light in their eyes come alive because <laughs> they were like – Wait a minute. So we can just draw whatever we want. I was like, just spin up, man. Just draw whatever. And from that point out, like it was just like they were just running with it. And like then I couldn't give them enough morphing sequences. So that's <laughs> one of those things where like you just don't quite know. And it's just all that translation of trying to like, like I don't, I, I sometimes don't want to be, you know, two hands on the wheel. But also you got to give them enough guidance so that they understand that they have the freedom, you know, to to work. So like that's, I think it's everybody's everybody. And th look. I have I've worked with over I think a dozen artists and I've never had like a bad relationship with any of them. It's been really it, it's our comic artists in, inherently are are like they're like actors a little bit. They want give them the material and they will run with it and they'll have a lot of fun. And and what about then conversely? What about character design? So and in, in the case of say original characters, as we're going to come to talk about in just a wee minute, uh, you know, is that something that comes from from you? Comes from the artist or again as a as a collaborative sort of experience yeah that's always that's hard because i think especially when you're doing in like licensed worlds um you're already working off sort of some established parameters so that actually makes it's weird that makes it easier in the sense that everybody like you know kind of where you're starting like if i say hey we have to come up with a new power ranger like you you understand it's got the helmet and it's got the boots and it's got the you know you, you get the general construct but the thing is also you've you're dealing with uh larger powers and larger so it's not just you and an artist and so there are moments like i can i can i can probably talk out of school there was a moment with the omega rangers where i got really really scared about the final design the design you see in the book and i literally was like i think we should 
completely changed the design at the last minute. Like I came to the, I came to my editor was like, I'm really scared. People aren't going to like it. I don't think they're going to think they're, they're cool. And she was like, dude, we've been working on this for six months. We've done like a dozen versions. And I was like, I know, but I think we should, she's like, no, <laughs> just trust your <laughs> trust. The artist, he knows what he's doing. Like he knows how he's had to draw all these characters. Like they'll look good on the page. Don't worry. And I was like, okay. And I was a hundred percent wrong. They look amazing. Like Daniele did amazing job, but I, and I trust him. He's a great artist. I love that guy. I just got scared. I just got in my own head. I was like, I got very scared about, about everything. And so that's one of those things where like, you do have to eventually, I think that's what also trust the artist. They know what they draw well and they know how they draw. So like, they're going to give you the designs that they want to draw. So like you, if you try to push them around and, and do the thing in your head, it might not actually look as good as the thing that they know how to do. I get you. I get you. Yeah. So moving on uh, to talk about some of those original characters. And we're not going to press you on this, Ryan, because I know you have a, a deal with, uh, with with some of the other guys about what you're going to talk about and what you're not going to talk about with regard to <laughs> oh, what's just coming spoilers, up. Spoilers, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but what we've got coming up is we have the supermassive one shot and then the spin out title Rogue Sun. So in a very general sense, if you can, and without uh, without being in any way spoiler-ish, what can you tell us about the Supermassive one-shot? Uh, so, so Supermassive is uh, a crossover between um, the image that consists the uh, Kyle Higgins um, image book, Radiant Black, which I think is around in issue ten or eleven right now. It's been up for about a year. It's uh, an awesome. It's awesome. It's a pretty great book. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Kyle, Kyle, when, when Kyle and I were working on Power Rangers together, um, and Matt Groom as well, who's, uh, who was, uh, who was working for the Ranger Danger, uh, podcast and was uh, helping us with Shattered Grid and all that stuff. Um, we were like, Kyle was like, I'm going to create, uh, an, my own superhero. I'm going to go do my own version of Power Rangers. I'm going to try and do my own sort of, uh, Tokusatsu Sentai stuff. And I was like, that's cool. And he did that and it went really well. And he was like, you should, you should do, an, you should do your own superhero book. And I was like, wait, I get to make a superhero at Image? That's all I've ever wanted since I was 13. 13 years old let's do that and so i we he was like well how about this let's let's do it out of an event let's let's have a crossover event that brings in your character matt's character inferno girl red which is one of the kickstarters that he did last year and radiant black and if, if we're gonna launch and let's have them be part of the massive universe let's 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 have them all come out together and we can you like we can we can make it an event we can make it a jumping on point for for new readers who have been reading radiant black and might and might like your stuff and it's a great way to like as opposed to you know, usually every it's a lot of small events that lead up to a big event. Let's start with a big event, and then if people like it, they can follow you out of that. And so that was the idea. And so Supermassive is is a 40-page one-shot that comes out February 16th? I think that's the date? Yeah. Um, I should know that now. I should not say yeah. that. <laughs> um, you can see how good I am at managing my own product. <laughs> like, yeah, I think that's the date. Um, but uh, it's a, it follows uh, Radiant Black, uh, Rogue Sun, who's my character, and Inferno Girl Red as they sort of meet for the first time and end up sort of, uh, without giving too much, of, it's hard to pitch it because it's like, you don't know what's going on. Um, but like they sort of end up, uh, Inferno Girl Red sort of finds her way into our universe. And when that happens, brings in uh, a problem with her, and so it's our character sort of uniting to to go up against them, and uh, and and you know, in essence, learn about each other. It turns into you know, there's road trip elements, there's there's giant monster battles. It's got all the things you want from the sort of the Sentai world, um, but with heart and understanding. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> that's the fun part of it. And so we were all three of us wrote it together, and uh, that comes out uh, February, like I said, February 16th, and then my book comes out one week later, which sort of picks up right after the events of of supermassive you were uh, you were much more confident when you said february 16th the second time i uh, yeah i'm practicing that. <laughs> also don't be too hard on yourself as i was doing my research for this uh there was an earlier interview you did and i think the original date was the 2nd of february and then it's been yeah. moved to the 16th so it's okay you've got an excuse you're all good yeah. I've got you covered but yeah you were saying there it's obviously going to be a week later that rogue sun number one hits and as a store owner, I'm a big fan of how you guys are releasing these so close together because I think momentum is such an important thing for any new title. You know, obviously you're you're going to be jumping off the back of some of Radiant Black's success, but it's still a brand new title and there's so many great comics coming out every single week at the moment. You know, it's it's a golden age for indie comics, I think, and creator-owned titles especially. Um, with regards to Rogue Sun, how did it come to be that Abel was your artist and am I right in saying co-creator? Oh yes, absolutely. I, I I should be saying that more honestly in all the interviews that I'm doing. Co-creator, co-creator, co-creator. Um, it, so that was part of the sell when Kyle was like, "You should do your own book," and I was like, "Yeah, but I don't even know the artist." He's like, "I got somebody for you." 
And I was like, really? Because Kyle knows everybody. <laughs> Kyle is like incredible at that. He's the he just knows everybody and everybody likes him. Me, I'm just like I'm at home and hang out with my wife. And then I'm like, I like, you know, I don't know anybody. But he he sent me a link to, to Abel's work. And I was like, this guy looks like Sean Murphy meets like Dan Mora. Like, this is exactly what I want. And and I was like, oh, my gosh. And so I, I immediately emailed him. I was, and I was like, will he do it? Like, would he want to do the book? And so I sent him the pitch document for the for the idea for the character. And he was like, this sounds great. And I was like, oh, wow. And to prove how good he is, we didn't have a design for the character yet. I sent him an email and I said, I think it's a knight that's on fire. I think that <laughs> I think that's what I got. And yeah. he sent me one drawing back. And that's the drawing that we went with. We didn't do the 20 versions. We did. He did one drawing. I think I said, can there be more fire? And he was like, a hundred percent, we can have more. I was like, could the fire be coming out of him? Like in the scenes? He's like, yes. And cause I've always loved that. Like I remember when I was like a kid, like Ghost Rider, it was like such a cool looking, yeah, I love that thing. And I was like, cause I, I'm a kid of the nineties. So I was like, can there be chains and spikes? And he's like, settle down. And, uh, but <laughs> like, I'm all that stuff. Like I, spawn is literally like everything I ever liked in a character. Like, Here we go. What did Tom McFarland say? Kids, kids love chains. <laughs> kids love chains. I, like I, if, my, I have a theory. If you go back and you read his Spider-Man run, I think it's number six or seven. It's the one with Hobgoblin, Ghost Rider and Spider-Man. Uh-huh. I think he drew that issue and went, wait, Hobgoblin's cape meets like, Ghost Rider's chains meets the skull. I'm that's spawn. <laughs> <laughs> you put it all in Spider-Man. There's spy. I swear. I think that's what happened. Um, uh, but, but anyways, um, but yeah, so Abel drew that thing and, and I was like, Oh my God, you nailed it. Let's do it. And once he drew that character, I, I, I didn't even have any notes at all. Like the mask, the helmet he gave is the helmet that was done. Which I mean, that's just an incredible, that's lucky. Like that doesn't happen. And he has been so much fun to work with because I, I, it's just like he makes every page so much easier. Like he makes me know what I look like. I know what I'm doing. Like I, I don't. I, there's times I'm like, I never, I never imagined that's what you were gonna do. I never imagined that was the way that you were gonna build that characters out. So like, it's a really that's the fun process in those first early days when you get an artist is where they're like, you're like, okay, well, here's Dylan. What do you think? And then they send the drawing over, and you're like, wow, that's it. And so it, when you find the right artist and you're in and you're in in a groove, it's really easy. It can be difficult sometimes if you guys don't quite find the right thing. If if you're not translating exactly what you want or you're trying to use comps from movies i think that can be difficult but like when you get into the right habit when you get into the right like the 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 groove with them it just comes out really fast and it's fun yeah i mean this is this is obviously going to be released as a podcast where we're not going to have the visuals of it but i'm just going to show you very quickly uh ryan if i may this this is our notes right here and if i go here it says am i right in saying co-creator question mark Fantastic art reminded me of a cross between Dan Mora and Sean Gordon Murphy. Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> as soon as you said that, I thought, have I read that in an interview or something? But I didn't think I did. As I was, as I was reading that, it, it was, awesome. it was reminding me of sort of like something like Tokyo Ghost or you know mm-hmm. something like that. And Dan Mora, I, I equate Dan Mora these days to sort of a modern day Jim Lee. You know, you look at his detective comics work. It reminds me of Hush like that. So at least I know we're on the same page here. This this makes me feel really good. Uh, yeah, whenever absolutely. you see uh, whenever you see Dan Mora drawing some of the stuff in Once in Future as well, you know, they are sometimes almost nightly stuff. You know, that's yeah. uh, definitely right there. And, and Ryan, you were, you were kind enough to send us through the first couple of issues of Rogue Sun, and we both thought they were absolutely awesome. Uh, a lot to look forward to whenever the actual issues come out. Very fast paced, look gorgeous, and of course, great art enhanced by the hardest working colorist in comics, Chris O'Halloran. He's the best man. I freaking love Chris. I, so I, when he, when he came on, cause he did some books for Kyle and he's like, Hey, I got this guy named Chris. You should, you should just take a look. And he sent me like some of the pages and I sent him an email. I think after I saw this first run, I was like, dude, I don't know anybody who does what you do. Like, like there's a thing that he does that I love where he, he uses color to not only focus the eye. Like if you have a crowd scene walking through, like he'll, he'll use the sort of matted colors on the other people so that you, it guides your eye towards the person you're supposed to be looking at. I love the way that like, there's a scene in rogue son where Dylan is like beating up a bad guy. And in the way that he, when the way that he did it, he, he made the panels entirely yellow so that you can see the fury and the anger of what's going on. It's almost like the fire's gotten so bright that it's blasted out all the stuff. And you get the emotion of the shot that wouldn't work without those. And that's not in the script, that's just Chris doing it. And the way that he uses like quick changes in tone just to show emotion, like I just, I, I, 
I can't imagine how much I didn't realize that a colorist can literally dictate the entire tone and style. It's in the sense that you don't have music. It's the way that a mu okay, the way that music works in movies, color works in comics. And I think that's Chris is absolutely. I I hope he listens to this because I am over the moon with how good he is, and I would work with him for absolutely forever. He's really, really, really talented. The whole muted palette, color tone, and palette of the book came from him. He was like, I think we. I don't want this to be a super saturated book. I think this should be a like a like a lighter sort of like looser tones. Like we should drop it down. I want it to feel. I don't want this thing to pop like like nineties. I want this thing to be a little more indie. And I was like, okay, cool. And like I just try now. I just trust him. I don't tell him what to do. I just like, hey man, here's the page. Let me know when you're done. <laughs> sure, it'll be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> we hope we hope he listens to this as well, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and a little. Well, he's too busy because he should be working all the time. He, he seems to be on every single title. You just see the surname O'Halloran on the front. But I think that it's great at the moment because it's what you were saying about creator owned comics is that you get to know the people behind it and those are names that you trust. And, you know, obviously you've got the yourself on the cover, you've got Abel as art, you've got O'Halloran for colors. And the letter, Becca Carey as well. I thought the lettering in this was great. You know, the, the voices that were in someone's head as opposed to the voices that are spoken out loud, the, the sound effects for the the action sequences i mean it's it's truly a collaborative effort that has brought this all together i think it really really shows no thank you man I, it's, it's that's the same thing too when she came in i was like she kind of bring like a punk rock kind of edge, edge to stuff like it was like non-traditional she's made a lot of interesting choices like non-traditional sound effects like usually it's like big and sort of thing but she does it all stuff like it's gritty and small and and i thought wow that's cool and like in and it's funny like it you see it when you when you when you first come when you first get those lettering passes and you're like oh yeah that's how it should be. And I guess that was the way it was in my head, but I just never – she pulled it out of my head and made it there, and now I'll just pretend it was always there. So, yeah, I don't know how to explain it, but, like, that's the thing. It's, it is kind of like working like I – guess, I guess it's probably how, like, you know – like bands work a little bit where it's like the, the one person adds their their style and their thing to it and then everybody hopefully compens or uh, you know melds with it and then you realize oh there's a sound there's a and if it works together it, 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 there's a sound that comes from it and i guess comics are kind of like that i've never used that analogy but i'm going to steal that and use that in every every interview i have now so thank you <laughs> perfect perfect <laughs> do you have any say in the the variant cover artists because you've got some some great talent involved here you know we've we've chatted with declan shelby a couple of times on the show and we've got a signing lined up actually in the store very very soon you've got obviously Danielle oh, cool. Kulu, who's doing such great work in seven secrets now and of course you worked with before brett booth i mean do you have any say in the variant cover artists or is that just a sign to the title oh no it's all you we all got it we have to find everybody um declan was actually i should probably tell this kyle loves declan i, I met declan once or twice and i've always liked his work he's amazing i, I was funny because uh kyle was like hey so i sent the design to declan this is before we even drew the first issue <laughs> like he's like i sent the design to declan and declan wants to do the cover and i was like no no really like he's too busy. He's not gonna want to do. It. He's like, no, no, man. He he's he he just thought it was a cool design. He'd love to draw it. And I was like, okay. And then they sent that over, and I was like, well, there's the cover of the first issue, and probably the poster, and everything I do for the rest of the time. So thanks, man. Uh, so that was kind of crazy. But um, yeah. So Declan's amazing, and and came in, and then um, uh, I was like, you know, I I like I said, I grew up in the '90s. I love the image artist. So I was like, uh, Kyle worked with Brett Booth on Nightwing, and I was like, is there any chance you think? Brett would be interested in maybe doing one. And uh, we reached out to Brett and he read the issue and he's like, yeah, this is cool. I'd love to help. And I was like, no way, man, that's crazy. And so he drew that cover and I was just like, this is nuts. Like, and that's one of my goals. There's a, there's a few other artists that I, 90s artists that I'm like, guys that I always grew up on. Not like the big guys, like, you know, like, uh, we, look, if McFarlane wanted to draw, draw a, uh, uh, a rogue sound. I'm not going to say no, but like, I liked, uh, there was a lot of like people that I thought were really good. Like I love Jay Lee. I thought Jay Lee's style was such a, it's such a unique and cool yeah, style. Absolutely. If we, if, if he can, be, he's one of those guys like, but also like, we're like Steven Platt was a guy that I grew up on loving. And I was like, that'd be so cool. And I think that's the fun about doing a new character is like when you get to do variants, it makes it suddenly feel like the character has been around longer than it has. Cause you have all these different interpretations. Like um, I can say this, Derek charm is a buddy of mine uh, that I did uh, star Trek uh, Academy with. And so I reached out to him and that is not a style. His style was not what you would associate with a rogue sound at all, but he did a cover for me that we're going to use for the third issue. And it's so cool. Cause it's like a very archy, like crazy looking. <laughs> it's it's rogue son. If he was in the world of Archie and like, I love that stuff. I love seeing like the different types of stuff like that. I think that's one of the, so what's so cool about comics is that you can get, you can get all these bring artists and it's a brand new thing. So yeah, we've been, I've been trying to find people who not only want to do, who just, you know, and like when we did Danielle, yeah, Danielle came in, it was just like, 
hey man, like he just did that in a weekend for me. And Marco Rena, who's who's working on Power Rangers, he was like, I'll help you out because I just love, I just like, hey, I would love to see how you would interpret the character. And so that's the fun for 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 a creator. I just get to sort of sit back and let them show me what like they they open up the window to their little world that they draw in and they show me my character and they're like, hey, that's what he looks like there. And I love that. Um, so like the half the fun is finding people that you know, would be, are really great and talented, but also people are like who you might, who might be outside the box, like people that you wouldn't expect. And so that's the real fun of, that is honestly the most fun about doing your own creator book. It's like all the variants you get to, you get to do. <laughs> I love that you're, I love that you're geeking out in this stuff as much as oh, we man. are as fans. <laughs> yeah. There all these, I, there's the whole world of retailer exclusives. Oh my gosh. Like you just get sent, Hey man, this one incredible talented artist in the middle of the country decided to draw your cover and you just get sent it. And you're like, what? Like there's some crazy ones that I've gotten to see that I can't wait to share with people. Uh, <laughs> great, I mean, uh, all exciting, fantastic, and you know, one of the one of being a being a comic book fan, one of the one of the things that that we all love are crossovers, of course, you know, and uh, that I suppose that that begs a question: Would there be any desire or or will or possibility of maybe other Image Comics superheroes venturing into the massive universe at any point? Certainly, I mean, Invincible, for example. Oh, I mean, shoot, man, of course. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think that when you asked about runs that were like that, I remember reading like 40 issues of that in like three days. Like thing where you don't leave the house, you get up and you're like, it's Saturday. What am I going to do? I'm going to sit here and read Invincible or I'm going to read The Walking Dead. Like that, a, Kirkman's books are just really good for those. Like he just writes book. And like I remember I bought the first two trades at this comic book around the corner and then I came back the same day and bought like the next two. And the guy was like, did you just, did you already read the other two trades? I was like, yeah, man, I'm buying these two. But so like, yeah, so like there's some, it, like I would, it'd be, a, look, if we can prove our metal, I guess if if, if the book does well, and it feels like I, I think this is look, I, I don't know how to maybe this is getting me in trouble, but it's like I feel like the other image books, like some of the, the the founders who've been around for longer, I think if we prove that we don't need them, maybe they'll come play. You know what I mean? I guess in the sense of like if I can because I don't want them to come in and just to help us out and like, oh, let me, you know, let me prop you up. But like I would love for it'd be really cool if if the other image founders were like, Hey, this book's doing really well. That would be really fun to collaborate with you. That would be great. I think that would be a validation of, of like the hard work that everybody's put into it. So, but like, yes, I think if we, if the book's around long enough, I would love to have any, there's like, I have a laundry list of image characters that I would love to have wander in, you know, and then, and not fight, just hang out. I'm a big fan of like, you know, I'd love, you know, rogue son and the savage dragon to hang out and get coffee. You know, that, that would, that, that stuff's the fun stuff for me. I like that. I like the conversations between characters more than them fighting. Uh, well, I mean, if the first two issues are in the go by, uh, you'll, uh, it'll be around for a long time. Oh gosh. I hope so. Knock on wood. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, reading those first couple of issues, you know, I, I could see influences of all kinds in there. Of course, Power Rangers, Radiant Black, uh, the the opening sort of almost origin-y type scene reminded me of something like Green Lantern as well, which I thought was cool. So I, I love that you're pulling from all these different all these different places. And and if I may say so as well, I mean, this is the, the ultimate upsell comment right here for every one of our listeners and everyone who comes into the store. But I was so glad you sent me the first two issues because that was a heck of a cliffhanger at the end of issue one. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly was. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fun because I haven't really talked about that part of it because like you get the pitch of the book, but there's another there's another element yeah. that I don't want to spoil because like cool. and once once you get into the second issue, it's a little more clear as to what the what the point of the book is. Yeah. Um, and I think you get the theme the themes are, I think the themes are all laid out in the first issue, but the second issue I think you finally go, oh, that's what he's doing. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to uh, uh, say something wrong and spoil it at some point, but I'm glad that you like that. That's really cool. This is so fun for me, honestly, just to be there because I'm like, there, and the fact that we're doing this live is even scarier because I'm like, okay, God, I we'll see if that worked. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was yeah, I yeah. was sitting and reading up my, my other half. Vicky was over my shoulder and I got to the end of the first issue and I sort of set it down with a little bit of a, an, not an annoyance, but sort of a little bit of a, oh, leaving it there and then i went oh wait no he sent me two issues and you know i was so so happy <laughs> it was one of those sort of damn it he's got me there but oh wait we have issue two i mean you'd mentioned there about you know maybe being around for a long time do you have a do you have an elevator pitch idea in mind for how how long your ideal run would be for for rogue son oh wow that's a good question i i'm i'm of the opinion that um 
I feel you know, everybody would be, be awesome if it gets a hundred issues. That's crazy. Right. But like, I'm of the opinion that I like shorter runs. I think if this thing could run, I mean, God, this sounds so weird to say this. Like, um, if it could run 25 to 30 issues, like I think the, I think that would be plenty for me. I think that, uh, I, I, that would be plenty to be able to explain, uh, you know, ex, you know, explore all the different things that I've had in my head. I think that's the hardest thing is like, I've got the first six issues are pretty locked down into what they are, but I, the next arc that I'm already sort of read in my head, you have to be ready for that next arc. And I'm already like, well, that's going to set up more of the world. And it's like already trying to build out that thing. And cause it's just, now it's just like finding the right way in it's like what at what order do you reveal the things that you want to reveal like i know what the end of the issue i know like if you told me right now it's like okay this is going to run 24 issues and what's the end i know the ending um i i know the i know what i want it to ultimately build to it's just like how long does it take to get there and how how much room and you know how we how we will get there you know we'll see um but you know that's that's the goal i think is just like and also i think one of the cool things is it once you last long enough the fun thing about doing a creator own book is just like, where can you get into enough of a groove and enough of a rhythm that then you can start to surprise the audience a little bit with some outside the box issue stuff that you've always wanted to do. Like, you know, having written, I think I've written a hundred issues of power Rangers. My favorite issues of power Rangers, are the ones where they were like, I'm just going to do the issue where we go into the box and see what Rita was like inside the, what she did for a, a, a 10,000 years. Like, like, and you see what happened. Like it's the things that are zany and off the wall. Like the issue that you follow the cat the entire time. Or like that, like, then I think like, you know what that's, and that's, those tend to be the, like, we all like breaking bad, but like everybody remembers the fly issue, you know, or the fly episode. <laughs> like, it's like, it's like that was one out of 54, but it, those are the memorable ones when you break the, when you break the, the pattern. And so the nice thing, if you can get a comic book yourself is, can you can it be successful enough that you have enough room to break the pattern to hopefully give some really cool stuff and like unless unless you're just like kyle and you just say screw the pattern and just do whatever you want every issue which is totally <laughs> totally totally do be able to go nuts so he's like he's a guy that i'm trying to he's showed me that there's an adage i heard a while ago that i thought was really cool which is once you've learned the rules you're it's your obligation to break them and i think especially when you are doing like there's a like you said there are a lot of great indie there's a lot of great superhero books out there a lot of great indie books if I'm going to have – if I'm asking a new fan uh, to come and read a superhero book that they don't already know and love, I better give them something that they are that they're, they, they can't expect. That's uh, that's really interesting, Ryan. I um, uh, I study, study martial arts. I teach karate uh, as, okay. a, as a side hustle. And uh, there's a concept called uh, Shu Hari, a Japanese concept. Understand the rules, Shu. Internalize the rules, Ha. Break the rules and make up your own Ri. That makes yeah. sense. <laughs> I mean, I was going to say and, that phrase sounded like a tattoo, but it does even more now. Uh, <laughs> and in the next issue of Power Rangers, Jason teaches everybody karate. So. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, we'll wrap uh, it up with just a couple of sort of bits and pieces. But are there any creators out there whose work you're particularly enjoying at the moment? And you can't say Kyle as your answer. Yeah, <laughs> Good, because he'll listen and be like, how many times have you seen my name on this thing? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm kidding, dude. Um in case he was listening, uh, who do I really love? Um, I have, I'm a little out of when you, when you're writing two or three issues of a book each month, you're, it's hard to, to read current stuff because, um, I tend to start reading older runs to try to remind myself, like I usually try to read stuff that's, that's in line with what I want to write. And like, so I've been going back and reading Brian Razzarello's, um, hundred bullets, oh, um, what a and just absolutely. Huh? It's the best. Oh, like, it's fantastic. some, it's art, man. It's just like, that's the stuff that I remember reading going like, Oh wow, this is, I got to work harder like because like every single one of those books just changes, just build, break stuff up. I really went back and read some of Matt for uh, Matt Fraction stuff, um, his iron. I love his iron, um, his iron fist run because that there's a lot of in the legacy hero of iron fist is like, obviously, if you read Rogue Sun, you're going to see the I'm just stealing from him left and right. <laughs> um, what else did I really like right now? Um, you know, Tom King stuff is just such a he has such a unique way of writing his chapter style of writing, which is like every book is its own story it all it's all additive but like it, it, i really do think he knows how to write it like in the world where i think comic books have become the serialization of comic books have become you know one of the things that drive the the the, the you know that the the cliffhanger and stuff like that what's so cool about him is when you when you buy a, a like a like a floppy you get a full story you get a full moment a full emotional experience and like that's the thing that i really like about his writing is like i've gone I've read his stuff and I'm just like, wow, dude, like you really, 
you just know how to create an, an interesting emotional moment. Um, so those are the three people that I, I wish I had more better creative, like, you know, Ram stuff's amazing. And, and I'm not going to give out any other people there, you know, and Kyle, Kyle's great. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> but that's the stuff that I've really been reading is some of the older stuff and, um, and just trying to, you know, just like, I try to go a little everywhere, you know, if, uh, if you mentioned Tom King, if you haven't had the chance already, I highly recommend a Supergirl run. Uh, if yeah. you like that self-contained story, but additive, it's unbelievable. And those emotional moments, to me, that's that's top of the game stuff. Like it really is, you know. So yeah, I just read his Up in the Sky, super his Superman oh, story, no, Up in the Sky, which I was like, that might be my favorite. I have this old without going too far into it. Like I have this issue where it's like the biggest, the weirdest thing about Superman to me is like he has a lot of great origin stories and some great death stories, but the stories about him just being Superman in just in the middle of being like being Superman every day, he doesn't have a lot of great ones. Like Batman has, you can go through all the Batman stuff, right? You know, it's long Halloween, it's dark victory. It's all that stuff. You can just hand those off, but Superman doesn't have a lot of really great ones. And then I found that one and I was like, Oh, this is just a great story about Superman being Superman. And I, and I love that. That cause he's like, he's the one that if I ever got a chance to write, I'd want to do Superman because I feel like there's just the, he's, he's weird. Like people love him because they're almost like they, they have to, it's like, well, he's Superman, right? You have to love him, but it's like, but like, he's not cool as, as Batman. He's not as, he's not, he's not Wolverine. It's like, and I want to, I just feel like there's so much, there's so much untapped potential in that character yeah, still, yeah. considering even though he's so old, it's like, yes, there's, there's, there's great stories about him just being Superman. And I want to do that someday. So. Awesome. But, and, yeah, I, will, and I will read this. I will read the Supergirl story. 100%. Do it. Absolutely. And we, we want to read your Superman for sure. Uh, we'll look forward <laughs> to that. And just. Just bouncing off of Alan's question about who you're particularly enjoying at the moment, is there anyone else out there, anyone else I say out there, who you'd like to collaborate with on a project? Oh, man, that's a good question. Um, uh, I think, you know, you know, okay, this is going to sound so sentimental and dumb. The one guy that I wish I had had a chance to work with, I, I love Bernie Wrightson. I think Bernie Wrightson's the greatest artist ever. He's my favorite artist of all time. I just uh, got the, I got his Frankenstein hardcover for Christmas, uh -huh. and... If he, I, I would have loved to have like gotten to write something for him, I think that would have been the most amazing thing in the world. I know that's not the good answer, but like he was, he's just the absolute. His stuff's amazing, and so, um, but that would have been one. Uh, but you know, there I, was, I there was not a thing wrong with that answer. Not a okay. thing wrong okay. with that. Well, let's answer, leave it at that. Now, I'm going to leave it at the sentimental. The guy who's unfortunately not with us anymore was the guy that I always wanted to work with. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll finish off with, uh, we had a message from one of our regulars, Stephen. He's a, he's a big fan. He's a huge Power Rangers fan, knows stuff in and out. But uh, he just sent us this to pass on. He just said, hi, Ran. I first of all wanted to say I'm a big fan of your work and that I'm enjoying the Eltarian War across Mighty Morphin and Power Rangers. I think what you're doing with regards to expanding the lore of Elgar with Sofram, Sartus, and Zordon is some of the best Power Rangers storytelling in years. Can't wait to see what you have in store for Rogue Sun. So you've definitely got one seal right there. Well, that, I appreciate that. That's very nice to hear. Uh, I was very scared about uh, that the Altarian War, and it's nice to hear that people like it. So it's great. <laughs> and uh, and uh, as Alan said, you have been fantastic with your time. So we're just gonna we're just gonna wrap up with uh, with a question that we like to finish a lot of our interviews with, and that is, do you have a favorite DC title or series of all time? A favorite Marvel title or series of all time, and a favorite indie title or series of all time. Uh, does Vertigo count as DC? Or is absolutely. That, yeah, that, absolutely. Yeah, buddy. That's true. That's true. Um, yeah, like I think I said it before. I, 100 Bullets is my favorite probably DC run. I think it just then sends. Um, my favorite Marvel run, I really love the Age of Apocalypse. I, yeah. I know it's I know it's kind of – look, I even – I want to slap myself for saying this because it's like I never like the idea that like alternate versions of established characters are the coolest things because it's like, well, that's easy. Like it's easy. <laughs> this coming from someone who created Ranger Slayer. Like I, I, it's, it's a little like <laughs> cheating. You know what I mean? Like Red Sun is like one of the greatest – like I love the Red Sun um, uh, graphic novel. I think that is such a wonderful and incredible poignant book, but it's like – you're riffing off of Superman. So it's like, it's not as, it's, it's a little bit of like once up uh, anyways, but the age of apocalypse. I remember what I loved about that book so much was it. I loved reading it in real time. I remember I would yes. go in each week 
I would yes. read all the different books. It was I had a book I, when I was moving when when I was in my twenties. I moved every year because you know you're you're poor. And yeah. I had I didn't have any real comics with me. I didn't have it wasn't digitally at that time. And I had one silver bag that I carried, um, which had all of the Age of Apocalypse run. Yeah. And I would just always go back and reread it. And I remember reading like the generation uh, the Generation X one, which is narrated by Gwen Stacy, which is yeah. incredible. Yeah. And like that was my first real like the alternate world thing that I was like, wow, this is like, this has consequences and mm -hmm. characters. And like, it just felt like everybody was like, everybody was just upping their game. Every single, every single book that I read, I was like, these are awesome. And so like, yeah. I've always loved that stuff. And, Man, and so I'm that's right part of Right yeah. there with you. You're, you're talking my language. I uh, of, of every one of the issues in a single, you know, amazing <laughs> X-Men, Gambit and the externals, all that, yeah. you know, back yeah. to X. <laughs> yeah, it was all and Wolverine without a hand, yeah, he's with yeah. Ray, and you know that's not gonna work out, and like <laughs> it's awesome. It, it felt and it was so cool. It's like I love the God bless Marvel for the commitment. Like they were like, we're gonna do this and we're gonna do it big, and we that could have failed miserably. And I just thought that every book, <laughs> yeah, until, yeah like, mad. Yep, here you go, yeah. yeah. And just expecting you to go along with it and be like, cool. And, and I remember it, like it paid off. The ending was awesome. Like it really, yeah. really worked. Yeah. It was. I just whenever you're talking about uh, about creators, you know, riffing on existing on, on, on alternative, uh, Jason Aaron probably wants a word. I, I read his uh, new uh, Avengers Forever number one this morning. And that, oh, yeah. That's exactly what it's doing. It's really cool. You'll enjoy it if you enjoy Age of Apocalypse. Oh, yeah. His, his Thor run is absolutely, oh. um, I think, maybe the best – one of the best things of storytelling I've ever read, like in just not comics, just storytelling like that run was like how you can it's I think that the coolest thing about comic books is like characters that have been around forever. And then someone comes in and tries something new and you're like, what? How did no one do this yet? You know what I mean? Like, that's amazing. And I love that. It's just such a crazy thing. It makes you feel like there's still – it gives you – like, you read it as a fan and you're like, this is incredible. As a writer, you're like, there's still a chance that you could – you could, that there's still opportunities. There's, like, even though these characters have been around forever, you can still do new things. And then there's the other thing in the back of your head going, but you can't because you're not as good as those other writers. <laughs> 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 and uh, just while we're on the Jason Aaron love train and talking about licensed properties, his Conan stuff is phenomenal, Ryan. Phenomenal. I got to read more of his stuff. Like, yeah. Oh, man. And, and let me not derail the question any further. What about your favorite indie title or series of all time? I love East of West. I thought East of West was really, really cool. Um, yeah. uh, I'm like, I like Saga, Paper Girls. You know, way to go, Ryan. Way, <laughs> way to step outside the box there, buddy. There, um, there's a reason that's an easy answer, though, to throw Saga up. Saga is... Saga is the comic that got my other half into comics. She had no interest in comics oh, before. Yeah. Read Saga. She now has a Saga tattoo. She's been waiting three years for the imminent return. And we're back next week. So uh, if there's a yeah, reason Saga's an easy answer. Here's what's going to happen. The minute this podcast is over, I'm going to remember absolutely everything that I always wanted, to, that I loved and always wanted to, <laughs> to, to talk about. Watch. It's just a minute it happens. <laughs> well, yeah, we, we 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 can get on with you again. Don't worry, Ryan. You can. <laughs> yeah, because otherwise we're going to keep you here for another hour. And as I say, you've already been ridiculously generous with your time. But it's just been a pleasure chatting to you. It's always great to see the passion that comes through, the the love for the industry, and the knowledge as well. You know, you you could put us to shame with some of that knowledge. Oh, I don't think that's true, but I appreciate it. Thank you. It's nice to hear. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so many, many thanks to Rampart for chatting with us this evening. Again, uh, it is a case of uh, February 16th for that supermassive one shot. And then, of course, Rogue Sun number one will be launching on February 23rd. So our thanks again, and I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this. And trust me, you're going to want to get on Rogue Sun. It was awesome. <laughs>